Welcome back from the break where you can see it has got very sunny all of a sudden here in Singapore. Now I hope you've been taking the time to network, meet new colleagues and visit our exhibitors. If you've missed anything or you'd like to rediscover some of the discussions from both sessions of EDS, recordings will be available on demand shortly. Speakers and delegates, we are nearing the end of this year's summit, but before then, we have two keynotes to discuss the power of education. Please welcome Professor Anand Agwal, the founder of edX and professor at MIT, followed by João Pedro Alzevedo, the lead economist at the World Bank Education Global Practice. Thank you, Professor Anand and João. Hello, Paulina. Hi, brilliant. We, we lost you. Um, so you're yep. here. We need to go live just like in a couple of seconds. Can you share your screen? Um, and my connection went down. I'll share my screen right now. There we go. Hello everybody, good morning and uh, good evening. I am delighted to join you as part of the, uh, as part of the summit. Um, in my discussion, um, I'm gonna focus on some of what we saw during the pandemic and what the world of education will look like in the future. We see four big shifts happening in the field of education. But before I talk about the four big shifts, let me start with giving you a quick uh, overview of edX and briefly some of what we saw. edX is a worldwide online learning platform where we partner with some of the top institutions in the world like Harvard, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial College, Edinburgh, and others. And we have uh, over 38 million learners from every single country in the world that are taking courses, online courses on our platform. We also have over 1,000 corporations um, signed up for edX for business and over 1,000 campuses signed up for edX online campus where the matriculated campus students can be taking online courses. Our mission is to increase access to high quality education for everywhere as well as enhancing teaching and learning on campus. So that's a, just a quick overview of uh, who we are. Uh, let me start by giving you some background about what we saw as we transitioned into the COVID era. You know, I jokingly uh, call the era before March 2020 BCE, before COVID era, and after March 2020 as CE or COVID era. So as we transitioned into the COVID era, um, as a online learning platform at extra.org, the first thing that we saw was that the result of the whole world going remote. Virtually everybody began to work remotely and learn remotely. And not surprisingly, during the week before April 11th, compared to the week a month before, like the first week of March, we saw a 10x 
increase in the number of new learners coming and registering on edX. In fact, in the month of April of last year, we saw 5 million new learners come to edX, which matched the total of learners, new learners who came to edX in all of 2019. So we, so we accomplished more in one month of April than all of uh, 2019. So huge demand in traffic for online learning all around the world. And to many, this felt like the old MOOC hype cycle all over again. You may remember in 2012, when the MOOC movement started, um, edX was one of the early companies that joined the movement. And uh, here you see an article in the New York Times uh, talking about edX, uh, where Laura Papano coined it the year of the MOOC. A lot of hype in 2012. And now in uh, 2020 and 2021, it seems like that hype cycle has repeated, where this article in Wired Magazine, as an example, talked about, again, the huge rush to online learning, the inc incredible excitement. But there's one big difference this time around. This time around, compared to 2012, we have learned a lot. Today, we have research and data that we've gathered over the past 10 years since the year of the MOOC. And we've learned a lot in terms of what online learning is really good for, what outcomes are we seeing, where can it be used, so I'll give you a couple of quick examples of uh, how, much, you know, how much more we've learned this time around than when we were experimenting in the early days. So as an example, um, at MIT, we performed an incredible experiment where in the fall of 2016, about half the students in a campus course on circuits took the course in person from uh, a usual campus mode coming to lectures onto campus. And then about, about half the students took the course fully online. And both, whether you were in the online half or the campus half, you were all registered students at MIT, but you got credit for the course on campus. So this was uh, a, a fully online course. And the results of that study are published in uh, Marshall 2017. Um, and the study was repeated both in fall 2016 and a, another course was offered in spring of 2017. And the results are pretty remarkable. Um, the online campus students reported a lot uh, less stress. They liked the flexibility. And in spring 2017, uh, we gave the same exam for the campus students, in-person students, and to the online students. And the exam was created by the campus professors. And uh, the exam performance was similar with an experimental uh, the differences. Um, studies like this gave us a lot of confidence that even for campus use, online learning would be quite effective. Uh, another experiment, uh, this is a pretty famous experiment uh, conducted at San Jose State University in California, where Professor Khosrow Gadiri uh, did a number of experiments in blended learning. He did it in spring 2013, fall 2013, spring 2014, and he published a paper on it as well. One of the amazing results from this study, and by the way, this picture that you see here is an actual picture from uh, the class where the students would come to class and solve problems in class, but they would watch the videos in place of actual lectures. So it was truly a blended model learning. In this study, traditionally, course retake rates or failure rates were about 41% historically. And in this experiment, the retake rates fell to 9%. In other words, the failure rate dropped from 41% to 9%, which is a staggering, staggering difference for an online learning study. So these are just two examples of a lot of experiments that showed the efficacy of uh, online learning, whether online, completely online or in a blended model. So we learned a lot during this time. And so today, as the whole world moves to online learning in a much bigger way, we can apply these learnings that we've garnered over the past 10 years and use it to our advantage going ahead. So with that preamble, let me talk about four big shifts that I see happening in the world of learning as we go ahead. Uh, the first big shift is the shift to online lifelong learning. There are two major, you know, COVID is certainly one big disruptive force. But the second disruptive force that is impacting 
the entire future of work. Um, the whole world, the future work is transforming through automation and AI, um, and as well as you know, COVID has uh, created havoc um, in the world. And these two forces, COVID as well as the future of work, are sort of combining and creating a double whammy for the future of work, where large parts of uh, employees around the world are being furloughed or laid off. Uh, employers are worried about how do we come out of the pandemic and have to grapple with the future of work where about half the population, the working population has to be upskilled uh, in order to be able to meet the demands of the future of work. And what we've seen during COVID is that a significantly larger fraction of people are looking to upskill with online courses. In fact, in a survey conducted by edX, 45% are more likely to enroll in an online course where this will help improve their career prospects. 58% said that COVID-19 uh, will, will impact the decision to seek additional education. So we are seeing a lot more of people looking to continue studies, continue learning, and many of them looking to seek online learning so that they can come out of the pandemic even stronger. Uh, we did a survey of learners that came to edX during the pandemic, uh, this large group of learners that 10x increase in registration, we asked them, why were they coming to edX at that time? And what was interesting was that while about 38% had more time on their hands and they wanted to learn something new, but the rest of the population was the same old approaches, the same old reasons why people wanted to learn uh, throughout their lives. So for example, 25% of them who came were in, in their current jobs, they already had a job, and they were upskilling in their current job. Um, and Joseph is one example who took the MicroMasters program in statistics and data science from MIT on edX. 11% of people who came were furloughed or um, unemployed, and uh, they were coming here to learn skills that would help them get a better job. And you see a picture of Maggie, uh, who I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes uh, uh, down the road. Uh, even among corporations, a huge, huge uptake in online learning. In 2017, just three years ago, hiring managers, 70% of, 71% of hiring managers um, had not heard of MOOCs. But today, there are over 3,500 companies using MOOCs and online courses for hiring and training. And uh, we, we'll just see this trend even in corporate learning increase as, uh, as time goes by. So that is one, one big trend, which is the big shift to online learning uh, and lifelong learning, both uh, as a result of the future of work and uh, the pandemic. Uh, the second big shift. The second big shift is the shift to shorter modular programs. Um, you know, traditional learning tends to be, uh, take a lot of time, uh, you have to get a degree, a four-year degree, or a two-year degree. Um, and uh, if you leave the degree halfway through, you're called a dropout. But during the pandemic, people had a certain amount of time, and they were looking to upskill faster so that they could come out stronger after the pandemic. And a huge demand for short, future-proof programs. In fact, 26% of uh, uh, surveyed learners we're looking to seek additional education to find jobs that would be safe during an economic downturn. And the smaller, shorter programs uh, are very, very popular. So for example, uh, in all the, uh, the key topics like AI, machine learning, IoT, sustainable energy, computer science, business, and of course, a data science, very popular. We also see increased demand for uh, many of the writing courses and uh, uh, leadership courses. So big demand for shorter future-proof programs. And we are seeing the same thing from companies as well. And let me tell you a little bit about, uh, more about Maggie. So Maggie was at Postmates and uh, she took edX courses, including a course on Six Sig Lean Six Sigma from uh, TUM. Um, but today she has a, uh, a job with uh, Amazon and she is continuing her learning as a lifelong learner. And so we are seeing a surge of learning as people are acquiring shorter skill-based certificates and posting them on their resumes or on their LinkedIn profiles and so on. And this is helping them land jobs 
post the pandemic. Just to give you an example of what a short modular stackable uh, learning model looks like, uh, here's an example of micro bachelors. Uh, this is a program that edX launched a couple of years ago. And you know, all of you know a bachelor's degree it takes about four years or, or more, and uh, you get a degree. But what we did is that we said, look, let's divide the bachelor's degree into modular components called the micro bachelors. So each micro bachelors will give you the equivalent of about uh, six credits. So a whole bachelor's degree is about 120 credits. So a micro bachelor's is about six credits. It's about 5% of a bachelor's degree. And if you complete it, you get a micro bachelor's. So for example, here's an example of a micro bachelor's in IT. And there are three courses. And if you complete them, you get a micro bachelor's certificate in the foundations of IT. And then you have two choices. One is you can use that certificate and you can use that for internships or to get a job <clears throat> uh, just with that certificate uh, in that short modular program. You can complete such a program in anywhere from four to six months. So it's short modular and you get a credential at the end of it that you can post on LinkedIn and so on. The other thing you can do with these short programs is you can also stack them up towards a full degree. So it's not like you have to pick one or the other. And so here, you can take these micro bachelor's programs and stack them up and earn credit. And so we partnered with Thomas Edison State University where as you complete micro bachelor's, your credit will appear on a college transcript, which you might be, uh, if you want to, you can transfer to other universities that accept a transfer credit. So this way you can accumulate the credit and eventually get a bachelor of science degree. You don't have to go and get the full degree right away you can be stacking up towards uh, and accumulating the credit over time. Let's move on to the third big shift, and that is blended learning on campus. Let me um, highlight using this chart. I want you to focus on the green curve uh, that is shown here. It looks like an inverted pan. I call it an inverted pan curve of online learning adoption. On campuses, uh, before uh, in BCE, uh, this is before March 2020, uh, the online adoption on campuses was virtually 0%. Virtually 0% of uh, learners on campuses were learning online, BCE. And then in CE, when the COVID era started in March of 2020, boom, we saw a huge uptick in online learning as entire campuses went to completely learn remotely and we came to the base of the pan, the heating surface of the pan, 100%. And that has continued. Um, more and more universities now, as the world is getting more vaccinated, uh, more and more universities are going back to learning on campus, but we're still seeing a very high level of online learning on campus. As we come out of COVID uh, over the next six months, I expect that the percentage of online learning will decrease and you get to the neck where the handle joins the pan. But over time, what we're hearing from faculty and students is that they have had a taste of online learning, and uh, two thirds of them are saying, both faculty and learners are saying they want more. And so I expect that in the steady state, in the new normal, I expect that blended learning will be the new normal on campus, where whether it's 50% online, 50% in person, or 60, 40, or 40, 60, hard to say, but uh, be that as it may, we expect that the new normal will be a blend of online and in-person learning. And that is the panhandle. So the panhandle will be the new normal. And so I do expect that this is what we will see on university campuses going ahead. I see the same effect to take place at companies as well, where corporate learning will also go in the same style where blended learning will be the norm. And what is interesting is that before COVID, um, when surveys had been conducted of learners and faculty, uh, many of them had never had no experience with online learning. And uh, many faculty, you know, uh, I'm a, I've been a professor at MIT for 32 years. Uh, when I spoke to some of my colleagues at MIT or other universities, many of them used to say in the early days, oh, you know, I would never do online learning or teaching, uh, online teaching, uh, it's not for me. They had never tried it, but after the pandemic, I'm seeing a lot more acceptance of it as they're seeing the value both to the teaching practice 
as well as to uh, the students learning and a lot more acceptance of online learning uh, as having a place in academia going ahead. So here's a quote from uh, Mark Branham, who's a faculty at San Jose City College. It's a community college uh, in San Jose, where he talks about how as the world, uh, in his world in community colleges moved uh, online, uh, it's a real challenge to create digital resources. And he talked about just a sheer number of practice problems and exercises that you want students to have access to that are online is overwhelming. How does a faculty member create all of these digital materials? So we partnered with San Jose City College where they took online courses from Berkeley and MIT and others uh, on edX and used them for the campus students as digital materials. Think of it like a digital textbook. And so because of the success of this model and the demand from many of our universities, um, edX launched edX online campus uh, last year. Um, edX online campus is a way for universities and colleges to enroll the campus matriculated students uh, and use materials on edX as if it is a digital textbook. Today, there are over 1,000 institutions around the world using edX courses on campuses. We also launched online campus essentials completely for free. So if you're at any university or college anywhere in the world, you can sign up all your students completely for free on edX uh, into our online campus essentials uh, uh, program and uh, enable your students to not only learn, but also earn certificates on edX completely for free, as long as you are a, uh, a uh, you know, credit-bearing university or college anywhere in the world. Some of the studies we've done on edX online campus, uh, we've done surveys to see how faculty are using uh, the content. Uh, you know, one of them is blended learning, where the faculty augment their instruction with the online content. In another example, we're seeing faculty uh, mostly allowing students to learn online, but helping the students as needed. And the third is independent learning, where students are allowed to take online courses <coughs> for extra credit without any facilitation whatsoever. So we're seeing these three models emerge in how people are using edX online campus. And Carlos is one of our students from UP Valencia in Spain, that uh, even as he was getting a degree on campus, uh, he earned a certificate from IBM in uh, deep learning. Uh, and so when he uh, completed his uh, studies, uh, he now had a certificate in deep learning from IBM on edX, as well as his uh, campus credentials. So uh, just amazing what value there is for learners and for faculty alike. And finally, the fourth big shift is the shift to uh, soft skills, uh, what I call power skills in corporate learning. Uh, we did surveys of our, we did surveys of our um, employees learning in companies through edX. And before COVID, among the top 15 courses in 2019, you expect, you know, we saw computer science, data analysis, machine learning, and business as usual. But for the courses taken last year during COVID, uh, we were surprised. We saw many soft skills courses or power skills uh, in leadership, communications, emotional intelligence make the top 15 list. And mind you, this is essential human skills becoming very popular in corporate learning. So I'll see this, I really see this shift to soft skills as becoming very important and a major, major shift that we see going ahead. So finally, the future of work and learning, uh, the remote work is here to stay. Uh, people will be looking for alternative learning pathways for lifelong learning. And we will move to a world of continuous upskilling and reskilling lifelong. And blended learning and training are going to be the norm going ahead. And this new normal is a good thing. And now is the moment for true transformation of education. And these four big shifts are good. Let's make it happen. Thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are in the planet. It is a pleasure to be here with you today as part of the summit, talking about the importance of data and evidence in the education sector, and some of the opportunities created by the COVID pandemic. Learning is a progressive and cumulative process. In order to have students able to attend universities, we need to ensure the proper foundational skills at early age. Those foundational skills are both cognitive and social emotional and are clearly affected by the parental and socioeconomic environment of our students. As stated in the Sustainable Development Goals and agreed by governments and international community, every school-aged children should be attending school. However, access to school does not necessarily lead to a proper acquisition of cognitive skills. Many of our children attending schools today fail to reach a minimum proficiency level in reading and numeracy. In October 2019, the World Bank and the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, building on the SDGs for education, launched the concept of learning poverty, which captures the notion that every 10-year-old on the planet should be able to read and understand a simple age-appropriate text. So why did the World Bank and EYS created the learning poverty measure? And what have we learned so far about the progress the world is making towards ending learning poverty? And how is COVID likely to affect this landscape? Well, the Sustainable Development Goal, or SDGs, uh, state that basically uh, by 2020, 2030, the signatures will ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. The various targets under this goal cover the educational landscaping, starting from universal access to quality early childhood development and preschool, and extending to equal access to affordable university education. But the very first of these commitments is target 4.1, which is to ensure that all girls and boys complete free and equitable and quality primary and secondary education, leading to relevant and effective learning outcomes. In other words, the world has committed to achieve universal completion of both primary and secondary school for all youth and with meaningful learning by 2030. However, given the depth of the learning crisis in many low and middle income countries and the observed rate of progress in recent past, we show that this target is not feasible. A target has to be ambitious, but it must also be attainable Otherwise, it is useless as a motivator to propel the required actions. This is true even before the COVID pandemic hit, and even more so now, as the school closures and global recession triggered by the pandemic has interrupted student learning and reduced attachment to schooling. The learning poverty metric is designed to spotlight two fundamental challenges at the core of the SDG4 aspirations ensuring that all children can read by age 10 with at least a minimum level of comprehension, which is the SDG 411B, and that all children are enrolled in school, which is the SDG 4114. The simple learning poverty indicator can resonate with any stakeholder, parent, educator, community leader, employer, politician, and it's also technically sound. Ensuring that all children are in school and reading with comprehension is essential to achieving the ambitious SDG targets and to build human capital in countries. Children need to learn to read so they can read to learn. Those who do not become proficient in reading by the end of primary school often cannot catch up later because the curriculum of every school system assumes that secondary school students can learn through reading. Reading is the gateway to all types of academic learning. A target of every child reading by age 10 is a fair development objective and it's a human right. The rate of learning poverty should be zero just like the rate of extreme monetary poverty or hunger should. 
in high income countries, the learning poverty rate, however, is at 10%, with only a small share not learning to learn to read with comprehension before the end of primary school. At the highest performing countries in the world, the figure is 3% or less. While it may take decades to build up an entire high quality educational system, ensuring that all primary school age children are attending schools which can teach children to reach a minimum proficiency in reading should require much less time. This indicator can help focus attention on equity. To eliminate learning poverty, countries have to give all children good foundational skills. No one can be left behind or below that minimum proficiency level. They cannot just try to improve their performance by focusing on top performing students, which will drive the mean up. This broad foundation of skills sets up the entire cohort of success for success in secondary schooling and beyond. Finally, the learning poverty measure is much more responsive to targeted policy interventions than any other measure, and it's easier to make tangible short-term progress on it because it requires improving only the learning and schooling of the youngest cohorts, and we have proven techniques of doing that, which, of course, it's a step towards a much longer objective of increasing the human capital and the share of students that reach tertiary education. Now, the development of the learning poverty estimates to develop this indicator, this measure, we combine data from over 100 countries that account for about 80% of children in the world using internationally comparable learning thresholds produced by the Global Alliance to Monitor Learning, the GAMO, which is led by the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. The results of this effort are sobering. More than half of children in low and middle income countries have not achieved a minimum proficiency in reading by age 10, or in most cases by the end of primary. An estimated 53% of children are While the share of children that are learning poor has been declining, the pace of progress is far too slow to ensure that all children will be able to read and understand by 2030. We estimate that under the business as usual scenario, that is, if historical trends continue, by 2030, learning poverty in low and middle income countries will have fallen from 53% to 44%. That is, approximately 11 percentage points and far from the SDG goal of every child reading by 2030. Even if every country were to reduce learning poverty like the top performer over the past 20 years, meaning that they match the rate of progress in reducing this, in improving this indicator by countries that were at the 80th percentile of their regional distribution of performance, the global learning poverty rate by 2030 would only be at 27%. Meaning, if every low and middle income country ramped up its effort to address learning poverty by doubling or tripling its historical rate of progress, it would only be possible to cut the global learning poverty rate by half. In October 2019, the World Bank announced a corporate commitment to support countries by 2030 to reach this objective of halving, at least halving their learning poverty rate. The goal of this target is to promote tangible progress towards the SDGs and improve human capital by focusing on medium-term learning goals and immediate action to improve foundational skills. Our analysis shows that this intermediate goal was already highly ambitious when announced, it, requiring a significant effort. And with COVID, um, the situation is made even more uh, dire. 
We are currently in the process of updating a few country numbers using the latest rounds of learning assessments conducted prior to the pandemic. This update is bringing data that was collected in 2019 and only made available in 2020. There are still several efforts of data collection that were conducted in 2019 that have not yet been available. And this is because the time that it's taken to actually process learning data in global initiatives is extremely lengthy. So a few, but a few messages already are emerging from this update. One is that the, the quality of the measure of learning matters and it can affect our understanding of the magnitude of the problem. And what is even more worrisome that the rate of progress that we have observed uh, between 2014 and 2019, so the last five years, has been actually slower than we anticipated. Just to give an example, in Francophone Africa, learning poverty has fallen by one percentage point over five years. That is a fifth of a percentage a year. What is also very worrisome is that ne the next round of data collection is scheduled to take place within five to six years. This underscores the need for more timely and better data on learning to tackle the global learning crisis and particularly to help countries recover the learning losses accumulated during the last two years of the pandemic. As we have seen even before the COVID-19 forced massive school closures around the globe, the world was already in the middle of a learning crisis that threatened efforts to build human capital. The skills and know-how needed for the jobs of the future were at peril. With 53% of children at the end of primary not being able to read with understanding a simple age-appropriate text, right? we were in course for a very dire future for a significant share of our children. The recent improvements on learning poverty were, have also shown to be extremely slow, and it would take almost 50 years to have learning poverty in a business as usual scenario. We try, our effort has been to expedite that, accelerate the ending of learning poverty by helping supporting countries to double or triple their rate of progress. However, the school closures and COVID um, have only made this worse. We have estimates that about 1.6 billion students were out of school at the peak of the pandemic. And several of those, this has exceeded uh, 12 months. Our estimates of COVID-19 related school closures um, are even um, say, indicate that uh, economic losses can add up to $10 trillion of losses in labor, labor earnings, while the work lives of this cohort, of this generation of students. This is almost a tenth of global GDP and nearly, uh, or the United States annual economic ad output, or twice the global uh, annual public expenditure on primary and secondary education. In our most pessimistic scenario, COVID-related school closures could increase the learning poverty rate from 53 to 63%. This is a 10 percentage point increase in learning poverty due to COVID. Most of this increase would happen in Latin America, East Asia, and, and the South, South Asia, regions in which learning poverty was high, but not among the highest. In sub-Saharan Africa and low-income countries where learning poverty rates were already close to the 90%, most of the COVID-related learning losses would happen among kids that were already performing below this minimum proficiency level, making the, the nature of the learning poverty in those, these regions qualitatively different. Now, going forward, as schools reopen, educational systems need to be more flexible and adapt to the student needs. Countries need to reimagine their educational systems and to use the opportunity presented by the pandemic and its triple shock on health, the economic and the educational system to build back better their education. 
several policy options deployed during the crisis, such as remote learning solutions, structured lesson plans, curriculum prioritization, accelerated teaching programs, to name a few, can contribute in building an educational system that can be more resilient to crisis, flexible in meeting student needs, and equitable in promoting uh, and protecting the most vulnerable. The results from these simulations are not destiny. Parents, teachers, students, and governments, and development partners can work together to deploy effective mitigation and remediation strategies to protect the COVID-19 generation's future. School reopenings, when safe, is critical, but it's not enough. The simulation results show major differences in the potential impacts of the crisis on the learning poor across regions. The biggest challenge will be to rapidly identify and respond to each individual student needs in, with flexibility and building back an educational system that is more resilient to shocks, using technology effectively to enable learning both at school and at home. At the center of all of this is data and evidence, and especially learning data. What we're looking, what we're seeing with the recent update that we're doing on the learning poverty data is that the how we measure learning matters and the alignment of those uh, measurement programs with the global proficiency framework used for the sustainable development goals is critical to, uh, for us to understand the magnitude of the problem. It is important to keep in mind that the global proficiency framework it was built using and analyzing the curriculum of over 100 countries and was constructed with the participation of countries. The rate of progress in reducing learning poverty has also shown to be slower than we need to meet the global target. That suggests that the frequency in which we're measuring learning needs to be increased. We cannot continue to measure learning only every five to six years. If we want to use data and evidence and create the habit for policymakers to be able to use this data to inform their policies, this has to be made available at a higher frequency. Moreover, effectively addressing the COVID-19 learning losses require the proper measurement of these um, losses. A few countries are engaged in, in efforts of this nature, but they are far too few and sparse. We need to increase the number of countries that are actually measuring learning losses and using data from pre-COVID, such as 2019 and 18, and measuring student cohorts as schools reopen in order to actually understand the magnitude of the problem and the amount of resources that will be required to tackle this challenge. For all of this, data is at the center. Countries need, and the development community needs to work together to create alternatives of more expedite, agile, cost-effective, and comparable measure temporarily and across countries uh, measures of learning. Now, together with the UNESCO and UNICEF, the World Bank is prioritizing a set of actions in order to support the recovery of uh, the education of the COVID-19 student generation. Some of these actions are related to data. We believe that decision makers and key stakeholders need to be supported to leverage the data that exists, but also can be guided on how to collect more and better data, especially as schools reopen. One way we're thinking about this is precisely to think of a minimum learning data package that countries can use. So stay tuned, we'll be happy to, to talk more with you about all of this. Thank you.